Hello economics enthusiasts, my name is Alzbo HD. In today's challenge video, we are going to retake Deseret in the name of Mormon Theocracy, transform an unpopulated and obscure releasable nation into a globalized and industrialized powerhouse, and dominate global GDP as an LDS MC. Join me in a world where Mormons control the global economy, outproduce the world in every single resource, and have a worldwide following of puppet polities to join our congregation. But before we truck into Provo, I'd like to give a special thanks to Paradox Interactive, the developers and publishers of Victoria 3, and the sponsor of today's video. In the default starting date, Deseret doesn't exist and has to be released by Mexico, so we'll throw on Iron Ombre mode and get ready to morm. Mexican Utah is unpopulated and impoverished, and nobody will notice if we secede, so it's time we take our pioneers and release Deseret as an independent state. Our first order of business will be to suppress the native bureaucracy, attempt to pass a theocracy, boost up our colonial policy, and build one barrack as we have no armies. Next, we'll send out diplomats to improve our relations with the US and UK. It's important to state that Utah has only 3,000 native tribesmen. To our east, the United States has millions of potential pioneers, so we'll seek their protection and become a protectorate. With our polity now in the American market, we'll pass a greener grass campaign, and our once empty state will bring them all the Smiths to our yard. But Mormon-Mexican rivalry was only getting started, and relations between our two nations started to sour. Salt Lake became our capital city, a revolutionary plot was suppressed, and the faith of Protestant Mormonism flowed into our frontier. Only a theocracy can fill our hearts with faith, mass immigration has changed our state, and our LDS pioneers were pushing into Utah. After only one year, 92% of Utah belongs to the church, the Catholic country of Mexico became our rival, and it was time to make bank by liberating historically Mormon land from the meddling Catholic hand of Mexico. So let's go and declare war for Nevada, make claims on California, and make Mexico pay for it. As a protectorate, we'll offer the U.S. an obligation in exchange for their participation, and in 1838, the first Mormon-Mexican War was declared. Early in the war, our men pushed the frontier, but our militia stood no chance against a professional army, and were pushed back to the shores of Salt Lake City. Our prayers were met with the passage of theocracy. The Americans had at last arrived, and we entrusted the Yankees to defend our temples while we advanced on the eastern frontier. The American armies made short work of the Mexican menace, but in our haste to take out Mexico City, we were too slow to realize that the Yankees had abandoned their defense of our country's capital. Salt Lake was salted by Santa Ana, but our sacred soldiers held their ground and eventually liberated their hometown. Today, we learned that Americans cannot be trusted, and despite their push into the Mexican peninsula, Santa Ana was back and laid siege to our capital. Regardless of what happens with Salt Lake, it was too little too late for the Mexican state, and poetic prose from Provo procured prestige for our polity. Our nation created an administration, Santa Ana prostrated himself for a capitulation, and Deseret now stretched from Nevada to California. Our rightful theocracy soon sought equality, and the newly liberated states were incorporated into our nation. With pesos procured, we'll invest in iron construction, hire a police force to deal with our over 60,000 new citizens, and begin the democratization of our distribution of power. And speaking of power, our Mormon industrial complex relies on voluntary contributions in the form of military reparations, so our next step will be to invade Oregon, take over Washington, and command Britain to pay our theocratic tithe. Rushing B.C. is of course done best with Russian support, so we'll offer them an obligation against the Canadian nation. War never changes, and the Russians, Tsar, numerous, and lacking British support, British Columbia collapses under Allied occupation. 
Our nation of peaceful priests seeks only to spread the good word, and so segregation will be ignored. An admiral of our faithful fleet is hired, and our ragtag team of two regiments is sent across the ocean to persuade Britain to donate to Deseret. The British fleet was busy, and our sacred soldiers made hastings in spreading the good word. London was calling for our Latter-day Saints, and soon the Midlands and Wales fell as well. The fire and fervor of our faith was spreading, but unfortunately, the UK sent their boys back in town, so it was high time to bounce out of Britain. With Russia uncontested in Canada and London in LDS hands, peace could be procured. The Cascadian coasts were conquered, and Britain's donations would single-handedly industrialize our nation. The UK's contributions now constitute 98% of our monthly revenue, so we can lower taxes, greatly increase our construction capacity, and take a mission trip to convert Hawaii to our society. Discrimination is unacceptable, and everyone is welcome within the Deseret Nation. That's why our priests will come to a port near you and take your palms as alms for the greater good. Our economy is taking off, and equality starts here, so let's welcome our Hawaiian brothers as voluntary subjects to our religious realm. But our American overlords had other ideas, and in 1843 bade us to bend the knee. Despite our loyalty to our liege, this diplomatic play has thrown Deseret into disarray. Our military is unequipped and woefully unprepared. Only two regiments are operational and we'll arm them with what guns and artillery we can scrounge off the ground. Our only ally, the Hudson Bay Company, has abandoned our congregation and little hope was left for our fledgling nation. The U.S. Mormon War was now in store and we were outnumbered one to four, but the mountains of Deseret were defensible and might hold the tide. By 1843, we've adopted multiculturalism for our polity, and soon, able-bodied and equal opportunity cannon fodder came to California. There were stories of gold to be told. The Mormon dream became a thing, and our nation's population exploded with mass immigration from around the world. These tired and huddled masses were ordered to furnish their own barracks. Recently enfranchised native tribes prospered under our theocracy, and our Mormon military was holding the line. Victory after victory was gained under our infantry commander Asaya. Native tribes and Afro-Americans fleeing U.S. persecution fled to our frontiers, and despite his kidney stones, our commander held his ground. Back in Salt Lake City, the passage of universal suffrage now meant that every man could vote. Saintly schools were promoted in Parliament, and the U.S. enthusiasm for war soon waned. It was time to hire a general, send out our Mormon Marine fleet, and after months at sea, our inexperienced armada capsized off of the American coastline. We need to buff up our naval industries and hold the Deseret Door, but American predation had finally taken the Ute tribe. While we now boasted over one million citizens, the United States had started mass conscription, and the tides of war were turning against Deseret. On May 14th, Salt Lake City was in Yankee hands, and while we still can, our diplomats scrambled for a white peace. This so-called peace with honor left our polity under the protectorate status of the U.S., but no land was ceded, and we'd avenge our defeat. Despite this diplomatic slight, our population had exploded from 300,000 to over 1 million. Liberal reforms made every man a king, and the American frontier split Utah in twain. All the same, our military and civil reforms under war had transformed our nation into a regional power, and it was Mexico's turn to cower in fear. Deseret's desire was to manifest its Mexican destiny, and thus war was declared for Arizona, Baja California, Utah, and a war chest of economic reparations. Isaiah the Kidney Stone soldier held the line while it was time for our Mormon Marine to land in Guerrero unopposed. Mexico City was taken without hesitation, the Mexican invasion of California had failed, and our economy was falling on account of Britain no longer paying for church reparations. Unfortunately, we're forced to fire off our construction sectors, but thanks to religious schooling, the church will pay for our students' salvation. 
Deseret was all out of ducats. The Mexican nation had fallen into capitulation, proportional taxation was proposed to solve our economic woes, and it was time to squeeze reparations out of the Central American nations. Unfortunately, our diplomatic play to puppet Nicaragua was met with Honduran and Mexican resistance, not surprising considering they could weasel their way out of war reparations. In a tactical repeat of Mexico's defeat, our navy invaded Nicaragua, marched unopposed through Honduras, and held the line upon the new border. Mexico's lack of fleet meant that we could repeat our tactics, and Nicaragua found herself subjugated by our state. Tenochtitlan was taken, the Yucatan was yeeted, and proportional taxation could now save our bankrupt nation. But nothing could save Mexico from annihilation, and they were forced to not only send back war reparations, but to also release Maya as an independent nation. In the space of only a few years, we've destroyed Mexico's prestige, surpassed their ranking as a world power, and it was time to spread the Book of Mormon to the Lamanites and make a profit out of puppets. Haiti would be the first to fall, the United Kingdom had fallen into anarchy, and our initial foray into the Caribbean was met with defeat. Somehow a repeat of our naval fleet managed to secure Haiti's ports, and at last the coast was clear. It was time to mourn on these Haitian heretics, and with their territory taken, Haiti became the latest nation to join our Mormon congregation. With Haitian help, our economy was now in the black, and it was time to attack Texas to convert them to our ways and abolish the slave trade. Of course, Mexico sided with the Tejanos, but our naval fleet swept through Veracruz, while our congressmen passed poor laws to attain social security. Back in Texas, our countrymen came and took it. Mormon Haiti single-handedly took on Mexico, and the Afro-American boys were back in town. By June of 1852, Deseret had destroyed the Texas capital of Austin. Resistance was futile, and Texas was forced to abandon slavery and embrace our Mormon faith. No human may be owned by any other, except Mexicans, who deserve their fate. This geopolitical hate extended to the U.S., which also declared war against Mexico, but thankfully we were able to secure Mormon Texas before Uncle Sam went south. Two Texas are better than one Texas, and our economy now revolved entirely around diplomatic donations to our expanding congregation. With Mexico and the U.S. at war, it was time to declare independence from American dependence and obtain Manifest Deseret. Our congregation would fight the U.S., Denmark, and the Indian Territory for independence, the unification of Utah, protection money, and the liberation of Afro-Americans from the institution of slavery. At first, it was quiet on the Eastern Front, and advances into Salt Lake were repulsed, but American conscription meant that we'd soon face 30 American regiments for every regiment of our own. So is quantity better than quality? <laughs> <laughs> no. Thanks to the fruits of child labor, our military is well supplied, but will reluctantly grant them more rights and take the fight on the offensive. What's the price of a mile? Millions of dollars, and our American neighbors are liars who cheat us, so we'll encircle their forces, plow into the deep south, and race against the clock to avoid war exhaustion. Thousands of feet have marched to the beat, and millions of dollars have been squandered, but at the end of the day, Deseret would have its way. Our Latter-day Saints were now independent, Utah was reunited, and New Africa was liberated from slavery. Back in Salt Lake City, our beds were burning, but our economy was booming, and the importation of tools has led to the modernization of our bureaucracy. Now that our state is single and ready to mingle, Austria and then Britain tried to seduce us into subjugation, but Deseret was interested in getting railed on its own, and the Industrial Revolution was ready to propel our polity into the future. Over the following years, Maya was puppeted in a diplomatic play. Textile lobbyists visited Venezuela and welcomed them into the Mormon market. Old Mexico forfeited control of New Mexico, and Guatemala's fate was sealed in subjugation. 
Mexican capitulation resulted in a contiguously conjoined nation. Honduras was proselytized, and we set our eyes on knocking down doors in Gran Colombia. By now, the Mormon industrial complex relied almost entirely on donations from neighboring relations, and Colombia welcomed our congregation by granting us control of their nation. New Africa was in civil war, American donations had ceased, and surprisingly, the United States was worried about our subject states, and opted to liberate the Cherokee tribe without a fight. Our campaign for door-to-door -door donations had by now reached Chile and Argentina, and the former pledged allegiance to our faith and flag, rendering our temples the tenth most powerful in the world. The Argentines joined our team, the funds were flowing, and subsidized BYU, the first Utah university. Temple garments could now be mass-produced, our capital was expanding, and a U.S. embargo destroyed our exporting cargo. This was an act of war, and we found ourselves up against New Africa and the USA. A neighborly naval foray into Florida brought the New Africans to the negotiating table, and they agreed to ban slavery, embrace John Smith, and join us in our war against American imperialism. Our war enthusiasm was low, but thankfully Washington was ours, and we were able to sign a white peace. We haven't really touched upon our economy, and that's probably because it's almost entirely protection payments and Mormon underwear. We'll mass-produce textiles, trade it all on the Salt Lake market, and start mining for coal. With our updated infrastructure, we're able to churn out industry, mass-produce furniture, and the Confederate States have literally ate their U.S. made. Our GDP was growing, the Indian Territory pledged allegiance, and the Cherokee were less willing, but we bade them to abandon slavery and embrace our friendly faith. Canada was radical, our population was radical, and we were now the number 7th great power. Canadian independence meant that we could bully them for Idaho, which they granted us without a fight, and Deseret was fast becoming an economic powerhouse. We have trains, cranes, and soon electricity, our constitution now guarantees civil liberties, and the U.S. ceded us Kansas so that we could lead the way in lead production. As the inventors of electricity, we also lead in energy, chemical factories, and are expanding into mass-produced groceries. Stable supplies of power have by now granted us unlimited power, and we'll use our factories to mass-produce ammunition and art for our alliterative armies. Production and energy was now exponential, a nervous America kept granting us states in exchange for peace, and a fearful Mexico courageously rose to oppose our policies, but they too would grant us the states of Rio Grande and Veracruz. We were dying to produce new plantations, steel foundations paved a wave of industrialization, and our GDP was about to morm. We had a national anthem, universal health care in 1884, and our door-to-door -door with Ecuador produced another puppet. This industrial boom made us reconsider polygamy, the United States were made to grant us more states, and our industry was churning out factories at an even faster rate. Our standard of living is now the best in the world. America cleaned up her borders, and secondary spouses gave way to women's suffrage. Mormons now control the global economy, with a GDP of 237 million. Foundations were laid for Salt Lake skyscrapers, and in only 48 weeks, the four tallest buildings on Earth were created in our kingdom of heaven. Our nation was touching the sky, social security was our priority, and the discovery of oil was about to change everything. Free speech was here, Deseret was now number one, and the discovery of the compression engine and joining of the Bolivian nation meant that Deseret ruled almost all of America. By the dawn of the 20th century, Deseret is the richest nation on planet Earth, has bullied Japan into taking control over Tokyo, and can finally produce silk and tea domestically. Our infamy is well established, and our economy needs rubber, so we'll negotiate the liberation of Lagos, Nigeria. 
With two trade ports down, the Dixiplomatically immune confederacy has declared a coalition war, which is great since we'll finally be able to tithe them, ban slavery, and conquer Missouri. This continental conflict was easily gained due to our technological advantage, and our naval invasion of New York and New England decapitated Dixie, and the South that was now the North would never rise again. Mexico would be the next to go, and after requesting them to join the Mormon market, they agreed, and what was left of the United States conceded their own sovereignty as our polity descended into international infamy. But hundreds of MKVs compel me to commence a Mormon montage, where we will go door to door and paraphrase the final 15 in-game years. Canada was invaded and liberated, an Italian coalition capitulated in Genoa, a subsequent French coalition failed and netted us Amazonia, and all production technology was researched, resulting in a second industrial revolution. Paraguay was pilfered and puppeted, Brazil was the scene of war crimes and fell in line, and an intervention in Spain resulted in Cuba and the Philippines becoming puppet polities. The invention of plastic and automation has resulted in rampant unemployment. Deseret designed the first airplane, and the Mormon Mobile became the world's first automobile. Italy sought a second coalition, so we made it our mission to free the Pope and take Tripolitania. Last but not least, Sigmund Freud, psychotherapy, and LDS tanks filled out the ranks of Mormon innovations. In 1918, Deseret is the preeminent and sacred superpower of planet Earth and oversees a congregation of 29 subject states that include nearly all of North and South America, Libya, Nigeria, the Philippines, Tokyo, and Hawaii. The capital of our nation is more populated than the Utah of our own timeline, and Salt Lake City is the birthplace of electricity, skyscrapers, and aviation. In terms of economy, we make more money than the rest of the world combined, and voluntary donations to Deseret round out a sizable income stream. Our prestige, GDP, and standard of living are double that of our closest competition, and nearly 70% of the resources consumed on planet Earth are produced the most in our pious polity. Our democratic theocracy is ruled by Woodrow Rhodes, a fan of gentleman's candy and a proponent of global infamy. Ruling from Salt Lake City, Deseret is a theocracy with universal suffrage, multicultural attitudes, one recognized religion, a professional army, and guaranteed liberties. Our mercantile economy is powered by proportional taxation, no colonization, the Book of Mormon in every school, and universal health care. You are free to speak your mind, go on strike, and vote as a woman, and slavery is banned as all Mormons are created equally. We've researched nearly every technology by 1918, have invested substantially in social spending, and have a prosperous population of over 34 million Latter-day denizens. These citizens are overwhelmingly American, 88% belong to our church, and most live in California, Utah, and Oregon. Further abroad, a fascist Germany dominates Central Europe. Turkey is down with the sickness, France, Portugal, the UK, and surprisingly the Confederacy own African colonies, while Michigan is a thunderdome of three separate revolutions. We've manifested our Deseret destiny, industrialized as the poorest polity on Earth, and enter the 20th century with universal decree. But you should tell me what nation you want to see, so let me know in the comments below. Before ending the video, I'd like to thank you for watching this far and supporting the YouTube algorithm. If you like Victoria 3 and want more strategy gaming content, I humbly request that you invest in the like button and subscribe to the subscription box. A special thanks to Paradox Interactive for sponsoring today's video, and if you're interested in checking out Victoria 3, there is a link to the game in the description box below. If you want to fund my future shenanigans, you can also donate to me on Patreon, or donate basic attention tokens to Alzebo HD on the Brave browser. I hope you all have a nice day, and that GDP goes your way. It's time now to roll the credits.